Tom here from Lawrence Systems, and this is different than my normal content. This is a Zoom video I hosted at LA2M Marketing Education. Well, they hosted and I did the Zoom call, and it's a breakdown of getting started in YouTube and how it can apply to your business. And I share all the details of behind the scenes and how I do the YouTube, how I got started on the platform, and some ideas for using the YouTube platform as a both a creator and a business owner. So this is stuff I've talked about broadly on my channel. It's going to be specific to this. I told them when I was done, I would upload it to my YouTube channel to allow anyone else who would like to watch it. Uh, all this content, of course, is free. And this is for people who couldn't attend the live stream. I also will have a link below to the slide deck I created for this, which was a uh, part of the presentation. For anyone who wants it, I have links to all the assets. I also, um, at the end of this video, is Q&A. So the first part is the slideshow. Second part's the Q&A. So if you're interested, watch it. If you're just looking for my other more deeply technical content, well, there's links where you can find all my other videos. Uh, so this is kind of a business talk I did. All right, let's get started with it. YouTube. I started this uh, around 2015 with the idea that, hey, I should probably put some content on YouTube because um, I have a cousin that's doing it. And we said she started talking about how well she was doing in YouTube and actually had a successful business and said, uh, I'm selling my business because I'm going to go full time YouTube. And I said, what? Like, what do you mean full time YouTube? I didn't realize exactly what all that meant. So that started me down there, down that little rabbit hole of what is YouTube? How does it work as a creator platform? Now, a little bit about me. I've owned my company for 17 years. I've worked in tech for almost 25 now. I'm a super geek. Uh, I dive deep into technology. So that's a lot of what my channel is about. That's one of the reasons I don't, uh, I won't bother any of you or so, some people ask like, well, you know, getting more subscribers, you know, do you post more on Facebook or whatever. I'm like, no, no, I have very niche content and I'm going to talk about creating niches of content as well from my perspective. And then also talk about how to create broader content and have a larger appeal, but I'm doing what I do. So it is deeply technical, um, very detailed type videos. And uh, being, just being in technology this long, also it's kind of a pivot because I do public speaking. Uh, I was doing that as a way to, once I started my business, uh, it was like, well, how do you get more customers? That was a real challenge for me because being technically uh, good at fixing computers did not at all equate to customers, it turns out. Not at, not even a little bit. Um, so I started doing public speaking and talks and that's kind of how I led into that. So it was an easy turn to start. Once I figured out how the YouTube system worked, oh, post those same public talks on YouTube. But let's start with the stats on YouTube and why it's interesting. YouTube right now has 2 billion logged in monthly users. And it's probably going to be even higher uh, due to the pandemic. The fact that, you know, more and more people are turning to YouTube for information. Uh, so I bet those views counts are substantially up. YouTube's kind of close to the best on some of their uh, secret sauce behind the scenes of exactly how much uh, is going on. Other interesting thing about YouTube is despite Google actually being owned by the parent company Alphabet, YouTube is, was never broken apart when they did that. YouTube and Google are still a singular piece of the Alphabet pie. So they have all the other divisions, but uh, YouTube you, you, is just not broke out. Google keeps it all in-house. Uh, so it's really hard to distinguish Google from YouTube, but it's obviously, it's not just a YouTube, it's not just a Google property, it's an integral part of how Google works. 81% of the 15 to 25 year olds in the US use YouTube. This is just one of those crazy numbers because pretty much anyone under 30 gets most of their information, how to's videos from YouTube. And the reason for that is, you know, look at even my kids, they started by watching gamers on YouTube. And that was an easy, you know, it's an attraction when you're a kid, but then you graduate high school and after my daughter graduated, she just went to the same place she always went to to look up, you know, things about her career, things about her college courses, knowledge she needed for things like that. It was the same platform she's using. So you're watching people grow up. YouTube's been around since 2006. It got really, I would say the turning point around 2009 is when it really started to take off with the younger audiences. And they're now growing up 10 years later with it. So uh, it's, it's a really important platform for this younger demographic. Now, one of the challenges is there's always these uh, debates about how YouTube should filter things or how they control things. And it's become a, it is a daunting challenge. And last year they hired a lot more people to help uh, do filtering and things like that on YouTube because with 500 hours of video, every minute are being uploaded. So in the hour that we have this, uh, you know, or this, the minute I'm talking about this, 500 more hours is going to be added in content to YouTube. And each visitor on average spends 11 minutes and 24 
uh, 11 minutes, 24 seconds per day on YouTube. When you talk about 2 billion monthly, and maybe I think their daily average active user is still over a billion, that's a lot of people. And, I, and to put it in scale as well, when you think about it from an international standpoint, you got to figure there's only 300 million, 329 million people roughly uh, at the last census in the U.S., um, that's a lot of global audience, a lot of global reach. It's also scary to think that mostly the core team of uh, YouTube is between one and 2,000 people. There's not a massive audience in there. 70% of what people watch on YouTube is determined by its recommendation algorithm. If you watch a video on woodworking, you're going to see more videos on woodworking. You watch your video on finance and real estate, more videos on finance and real estate. Um, the, the discoverability of videos on YouTube is what it absolutely makes it an incredible platform and really tops Facebook. One of the problems with Facebook is it's ephemeral. I create a video, I upload it to Facebook. Try to find my video from last year. You'll spend 20 minutes trying to find anything I posted from last year on Facebook other than what comes up in memories and that gets reshared. Facebook has never really cracked the system for good recommendations and a good platform for it. So when you want a right now thing, uh, you want a right now video where I want to share something out on Facebook to say I want to attract audience to watch something longer. Facebook's great for getting a three minute clip out there and having a discussion about something that's of the now, but it falls away, fades away into the background versus YouTube. I've got videos, my videos from 2016. I still have a very popular video, and this is what they refer to as evergreen content, content that's still relevant. If you were doing a video on, we'll go back to the example of finance, certain principles of finance and how you get a loan or how you uh, increase your credit score, they may change, those rules may change a little, but that's kind of evergreen content. It lasts several years. Videos I've done that are still relevant today about technology I talked about still get views and the discoverability algorithm. If someone watched even a newer video on that same topic, my video from three, four years ago still comes up. So their algorithm is really um, what makes YouTube one of the really amazing platforms for doing this. In the US alone, YouTube will make $5.5 billion in advertising revenue in 2020. It's incredible how much, uh, and it's maybe with, and these were some of the earlier numbers. This is from a Hootsuite blog. Um, it's probably gonna increase more because a lot of the uh, advertisers right now, so much in my industry was dependent on those physical events. A booth at a tech event can cost you ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 to attend a tech event as a vendor. Well all that money is still floating around. Those tech events got canceled. Those companies still have to sell product. They're going to be pushing more and more for platforms like YouTube um, for their advertising revenue. Now, this advertising revenue doesn't just go to support the platform in terms of, you know, keeping the lights on. It also is divided up, and this is one of the things I'm going to show you, with the creators. So you are incentivized to create content because they do split those ads. That ad you may watch before a YouTube video gets split with the creator and, of course, YouTube to well, keep the lights on and keep the servers running and pay the teams that develop things. Now, there's two strategies for YouTube. You can buy ads, which is all part of the Google AdSense network. The same way you buy targeted ads or any type of very specific advertising that goes onto YouTube, that goes onto the Google pages, the Google ad system, it's the same ad system. This is one of the reasons Google doesn't separate themselves from YouTube and it's kind of one big thing. Google uses the indicators from what videos people watch, their geography, also what they search for. So all that two data points are separate from what way most people see it, you know, web and SEO, what was searched for, targeted ads. And then YouTube, Google sees them as one piece. And by having those two different data points, they know what you were searching for. And that's often why YouTube videos are favored as top search results. And you can buy those ads. And the other way to do it that without buying ads is create available content. So I see we're going to talk about the create available content because, well, this whole talk would end at buy ads, just buy ads if you just want to get it out there. The challenge with buying ads, though, is try to get someone's attention with a commercial. People are just waiting to click that skip button all the time. Uh, everyone that works in advertising knows creating compelling, engaging ads is really, really challenging and getting people to watch them. So if you want to get started on creating content, first start with be useful. Create content around a subject or theme that an audience can follow. Channels that follow a consistent theme build audience much faster. So I've seen someone ask about subscribers. This is, you know, if you look up anyone on YouTube who talks about the mistakes they made getting started, almost always it's like they, they became the variety channel. They decided that everything they could possibly make a video on, they made a video on. And if your audience doesn't know what to expect from you, they, why would they subscribe to you? If you are jumping between 
random topic to random topic, that doesn't necessarily create a subscriber and an audience that's engaged with your content because they're like, I don't know, the person talked about cooking one day and cars the next day. So I like their car videos, but eh, I don't feel like watching their cooking videos. So you kind of niche into what is really good for your audience. And by the way, it's an ever-changing, moving target that you may not get right the first time. That's just the nature of it. Now, you can also be an entertainer, and this is a harder part, too. So I create tutorials. I don't really look at myself as an entertainer, but this is definitely a very popular category. People like to be entertained. This is why we like movies. This is why we like you know, watching someone along for the journey, along for the story, uh, whatever their compelling things. A lot of the travel people do this, like the travel bloggers and things like that that are popular on YouTube. Um, they create a compelling story and bring you along for the entertainment for what they're doing. That sounds easy on the surface, but it's actually a lot of work doing this. Um, it's not something I do, but it is a valid point on YouTube. This is where a lot of people you know, get their entertainment from, especially the younger audience. And this is what the gamers really, to me, are entertainers. And I, it's always weird when people ask the question of, well, why would people watch other people play video games? It doesn't make any sense. I'm like, look at a sports stadium. You're watching other people play a real world thing. The kids lend themselves to watching themselves play their favorite and they have their favorite stars. They have championships and that whole industry. So that is an interesting way for you too, but we're going to focus on what I do here in the tutorials. And I think this lends itself easier to the business people because anytime you're employed, whether you own a business or you're employed by someone, you have some skill that that business is leveraging. You can take that knowledge. There's still people who want to buy that knowledge as you work in that company, or you can put it out there as tutorials and become the perceived expert. So if you create content that educates people, uh, create use cases and show how you're using that knowledge or product, that's a lot of what my focus is. So there's just a tutorial and I do a lot of those, but then I also create content that's very showing how I use the product, showing how we integrate it into our workflows. And that's my tutorials go a little bit more in depth. I talk about products we use. Now, I'll break down how that actually equates into business and also some of the YouTube business for it. Because the next question is, you know, I've talked a little bit about it, but now what? And I purposely left this blank because this is how people go, I'm going to get started on YouTube and they sit down in front of the computer and they stare at a screen going, what am I going to do? It does take a lot of thought and planning because starting from zero is really hard. This is probably the first video is probably one of the hardest ones you're going to make. And you'll, you, anytime you dive into, uh, if you type in you know, mistakes, first time YouTubers make, which is a fun search, you'll have a lot of people talk about it. And some of the big YouTube people and personalities have talked about, wow, I spent a lot of money. I did all this uh, work and I scrapped the entire project um, after putting tons of time into it. And I still started with a blank slate again, because it was so hard to analysis paralysis. It's, a, it, it's really a challenge, but I do think a lot about it on the strategy, but get something out there. Now, the first thing people seem to do, especially I meet a lot of business owners who want to jump into YouTube, and we have a few dollars set aside, so we're going to buy a bunch of gear. And I encourage anyone who asks me about getting started on YouTube, I point them to Casey Neistat's Guide to Filmmaking. Uh, Casey Neistat's a very interesting uh, YouTube personality creator. With He's one of the top YouTubers. Uh, but what does he actually do for a living? Well, he works with brands you might have heard of like Nike and Samsung to create commercials and content. He talks a lot about uh, filmmaking and he's just a pretty epic and prolific creator. But one of his guides to filmmaking starts with gear doesn't matter. And he talks about how some of the most inexpensive equipment that he used, we're talking like really cheap camcorders. He won an HBO special that was actually nominated. And uh, the other thing he highlights, I think is so important and it's a good hit home thing. He talks about movies that bombed with $200 million plus budgets. And he says, if, if all it took was money to create great content, a $250 million budget for a movie means that movie would be absolutely successful no matter what. But all of us can think of a movie that failed no matter how big your budget was. It comes down to focusing on that idea and everything else. Right now I'm recording on these two things and I have videos that have over 200,000 views, deeply technical tutorials that I have this brand new $129. You can pay for this Blue Yeti microphone. You can find them used for like 50 bucks. Um, and this you just can't find right now because of the pandemic, but this is still sold new for $79 used for like $25 on eBay, uh, the Logitech C920. This is what I'm using to record this. This is what I still to this day use for a lot of my recordings. It doesn't take a lot. Matter of fact, Working within the constraints of a lesser system, so to speak, makes you focus on your content and really think about it. And that's kind of what Casey Neistat mentions in his guide to filmmaking. Um, and I think there's a lot of value in that because first figure out what you want to do and start honing 
your content to make it really good before you go out and build the studio. The other thing I use is this free tool called OBS Studio. Uh, this is free for Windows, Mac, or Linux uh, for recording tutorials and content. Um, I told Lee I wouldn't spend too much time on this, but I wanted to mention at least these are just some of the basic tools to get you started. Um, by the way, you can see that this is a less than $200 investment to get started on YouTube. Um, all, the, all the time is on that idea. Now, over the years I've grown, uh, this is a kind of snapshot of my studio and I detail out so I won't spend any more time on this all the things in my studio that I bought over time. Because once I figured out what I wanted to do, it was actually easier to pick the hardware that worked for me for how I wanted to do things. So that's how we ended up building out the studio was completely based on uh, my needs of understanding what I need. So this didn't even get built towards, uh, I think that mid uh, 2018, we built it in 2017, 2018 is when we started building it out like in more detail. All right, so how does this actually look on the back end? Where am I at? So we were talking about the subscribers and I snapshot this yesterday. So I got 122,611 subscribers as of yesterday. There's probably more today. Um, 70,000 views, 3.4 million views. This is all over the last 90 days. Uh, overall views on the channel, watch time and hours they break down, 18,000 more subscribers in the last 90 days. And this is that ad split I'm talking about. So my estimated revenue, which is actually uh, was a little bit higher than this. They always say estimated, but it, they do break it down a little bit differently when they do the deposits. But um, that's how much I made just exclusively from YouTube, $11,319 over the last 90 days. So what does that look like in terms of analytics when it comes to reach? Impressions are anytime someone came across my content or channel. So this is 53.9 million impressions. Uh, that led to a 3.2% click rate, uh, 3.4 million views, like I had mentioned on the other page. But this is the really interesting part. So even though I only have 120,000 subscribers, the 1.3 million unique viewers, most of my content, because it solves a problem, it's a tutorial. It only, uh, my subscribers are just only a small percentage of it. People search for something. They search for how do I do, and, and I often have a video on that particular technical thing and they watch it. They may not lend them to subscribe, but they then see me as the expert in that because they watched an entire video where I technically go through and walk through that process and create that tutorial of how to do it. So it, I end up with a really high unique viewer count. Th this changes a bit if you're uh, storytelling, if you're a entertainer type, of YouTube because they want to subscribe to you because you're going to do the next in your series of what, what your story is and what, how you're going to bring them along for the story. So it's going to vary um, on that. But for me, I have lower subscribers, but really high unique viewers. Now, how does that translate into people even going to your website? Well, I thought I'd break that down as well. So lawrencesystems.com, my company, um, we've got 26,000 new users. This is the same. I, I think the Zoom thing might be in a way, but this is a 90 day snapshot in, as well. Uh, 27,000 unique viewers are new, 26,000 new users over the last 90 days. And most all of that comes from people that see my YouTube channel, then they kind of whittle it down. And of course, we've all seen the sales funnel diagram where we take the impressions, views from impressions, watch time, and on our website, there's a little button at the top that says hire us. That's what they're coming to our website for. The hire us page has a bunch of details about our rates. One of the things I learned very quickly was when you're doing things at scale and the most common question was, how much do you charge? I realized if I didn't have that on there, I would get way too much in my funnel of people asking that question. So actually we put all of our rates, we keep all of our uh, consulting rates and project rates listed on our website. And it whittles it down to when they click the form that literally says this, contact a human, you can go to the website and see it. You'll see that. Uh, we're only getting probably about uh, five to 10 people a day that contact us. But the good news is that's about an 80% close rate because they've seen our rates. They know what we do. They watched the video. They watched the tutorial. By the time they decide to contact us, all those questions have been answered. So when they say contact, that means I want to hire you for a project. And I also, for those of them people, and there's kind of another segue here, when they don't want to hire me for a project but still want to engage with me, I set up forums. And right now the forums, just these is another 90 day snapshot for last quarter, 2.5 thousand posts in my forums. It gets about uh, a day, 4,000 
views. Now this is across uh, the breakdown. That's why I have the status here. So over 1,117 1, people actually created accounts on my forums to interact with. Anonymous people, because it just gets search indexed because they're public and free. Um, so another 1,800 anonymous and then crawlers are uh, Google and other bot systems that actually index it, which also helps people find me and uh, have those discussion topics. This is an important part to me because sometimes people, they aren't always ready to hire, but they want to ask some questions. But I, I mean, when you talk about 1.3 million unique viewers and whittling it down to someone has a question, I don't have time to answer 2.5 thousand questions. So having these forums is another important aspect to kind of whittling it down before companies uh, want to engage with us. Now, what are the videos that I'm doing? This is an example of a video I did on April 4th. And this is also why I said I don't push people towards my content or post on Facebook. I'm like, don't worry, people who are looking for something um, and they know what I do, they will hire me because I'm going through and I said, unless you're in my industry, uh, this probably isn't interesting. This is a really technical deep dive where I dive into the back end of exactly how Zoom contacts other servers, how it does its established TCP IP connections and all kinds of nerd stuff. So, uh, but what this has done is because people know that me and my team know how to dive into these type of topics, they frequently will hire us for engagements, for security engagements, for um, diving into network engineering and things like that. This is a lot of why I do these deeply technical and there's this concept that well, Tom, if you showed people exactly how to do it, they won't hire you to do it. And I will tell you that just doesn't hold water in any measure. I absolutely, on so many of my tutorials, I walk through in depth and I create content that sometimes this one's only uh, about a nine minute video. Some of my videos are over an hour long of me walking through step by step, piece by piece without leaving any details out of how to set something up those videos convert extremely well to people hiring us to just do the same thing. They look at it, and it's the same thing. You could say, wow, I could watch a video on how to fix my car, but then you look at the complexity of it and you go, that person knows how to fix my car better, so I will take it to them. And the same thing is what happens is by creating content that is absolutely in-depth, no, you know, no uh, part way through, I say, buy my book where I'll tell you exactly how to click the finish button on this. It's, it's nonstop, free game to end tutorial. And for those people that are just looking to do it without hiring me, cool, they got the information without hiring me. For those people that go, that person seems to be an expert because 40,000 people um, watched this video, it helps establish your uh, relevance in there. Now let's break down a couple of our ideas. I don't want to talk about just me doing tech, but I will talk about a couple other people that I do occasionally follow on YouTube that I also found interesting. And, and I know a lot of you are in a lot of different industries and I want to throw ideas out there. Uh, Graham is an interesting individual because he, his YouTube channel, he shares out everything he does and how a 29 year old YouTube millionaire making up to $220,000 a month spends his money. He's really funny because he, uh, the joke with him holding the coffee is if you're a follower of his channel, you realize very quickly, he jokes about how you shouldn't spend $5 on coffee because he's really, really frugal. And he talks about starting from nothing and building everything up. These are kind of a snapshot of some of his videos. Now, one of the things he does that I think is interesting is who hasn't seen the click baity type things of the sale, the traditional, which I'm just not a big fan of, uh, sales funnels. And there are these financial freedom scams, sign up for this, sign up for that. And they give you kind of low value content, but made you sign up for all their marketing and send things. He's someone who just breaks down real estate concepts. By the way, anyone who's worked in real estate probably knows more than Graham, especially when he started. So you actually follow him. He's only had his channel for a few years, but it grew very fast because he's just talking about how to buy houses, how he spent money with contractors, when he hired different contractors, what went wrong. He's very honest about it. And I find that very interesting, but here's a guy that resonates, not just because he's young, he's just someone who chose to start doing it. And before you think that he may have some complicated way of doing it, he does it very much like this guy does, who also is a little bit interesting because here's a young guy that I like the, the name of whiteboard finance. He's talking about finance literally on a whiteboard. He sets a camera up, sets a whiteboard up. So how many of you have a camera, maybe on your phone, um, have access to a whiteboard that you could go buy for pretty cheap, um, some dry erase markers, and then this video in particular, I think it's funny how he breaks this down. So how car dealerships rip you off, the truth. It's, it's, um, it's okay, it's not a bad video. It's got 6.7 million views, but what 
the concept is really interesting. He talks about, and how many, how many of us know other people that made a bad financial decision? They bought a lease, they racked up a bunch of miles, got nothing under trade in, rolled it in, and now they're making a car payment that doesn't make any logical sense at a high interest rate when he could have done something else. He takes 11 minutes and just breaks down what is common sense to a lot of people who are, you know, let's just say over 30, uh, who've spent any time reading a little bit about finance and have had some real world experience. But who's that audience? You have a lot of young people going, I was searching for games, now I'm buying my first car. They're on the same spot. How much do you make off a video like that? When the video hit 5 million views, he did this other video for how much YouTube paid me for 5 million views. I didn't want to share the whole video in here, but you can watch it. It's another one of his videos. They're all about 11 minutes long. And he breaks down uh, how much he made at the time. It's actually more because if you know, it's at 6 million, 6.7 million views now. He made $41 off of that particular video, just talking about how to refinance your car. So just throwing it out there, pretty easy idea. But let's go to a whole nother topic. Maybe some of you work in finance. Some of you work in accounting. Clearview Tax. Um, I discovered this channel and I thought it was kind of neat. And uh, he did a great job. He just sits down and sits in front of a camera and explains accounting, business accounting, and some of the back end for you, pretty tax preparation work. And uh, recently, of course, he's been pretty popular. No fancy editing. Matter of fact, no editing. He just seems to hit record and then stop and talks about um, stimulus check questions, which by the way, as you know, if anyone's dealt with the PPP or stimulus check, there's unlimited content you can create around it because the rules keep changing and there's more information. So him breaking down these videos, uh, the last couple of them he did, 2.6 million, 2.5 million, 1.8, 1.8. And I will tell you, it is undoubtedly led to, I don't know this person at all personally, um, it is undoubtedly led to more and more people finding him, more and more people hiring him, contacting him for advice. And any of those are going to be really, you know, that's what happens when you start making these videos. Everyone starts learning who you are. It helps your everything around you SEO. And by the way, um, when you start looking at what this probably pays per video, you can say, okay, if you made 41,000 on 5 million views, roughly, you may say he made $10,000 for each one of these videos, just talking about what he already knows with accounting. Um, it's hard to say what the ad rate was on there. It does vary, but you kind of get in the concept here that someone who just leveraged your expertise in accounting. And if you're in accounting, you have an expertise in accounting. It's, it's really that simple. I'll last kind of bring to, you know, something, this is actually what my cousin does for a living. And it's really fascinating. And she actually said, uh, maybe she'll do a interview at some time. If anyone's interested, I can always ask her about it. Sometimes she talks a little bit about behind the scenes. She speaks at some big events. Uh, she's got about a, close to a million subscribers. She has several channels she's done. And she literally has stories about her dogs that pays a very good living for her. Um, 8.4, 8.5 million views over just the last 30 days. And by the way, she doesn't post that often. She's only posted four videos in the last 30 days. Um, 283 million views overall on her channel. And it's really interesting because uh, her brand deals that she works out, she's been featured by uh, Pet Supply Plus in lots of places just because she has dogs. So she's got ad placements, mentions, um, everything else. But this is a business where all she does is kind of talk about exactly what it says here, treats, travel, and fun. Um, she just kind of lives a very relaxed life. So I kind of pivoted across you know, a couple different ones here, but you'll see that you can do about anything you want on here for YouTube and share that expertise and really create a lot of content around it. Now, earlier, I, I know, I think it was Sarah had mentioned uh, working at HR and uh, working with some of the businesses that want to reopen in the manufacturing space. Let's talk about some of that. So if you were to look at something like that, you could say, well, why not do a, you could delete just with a cell phone. Uh, you could do it with some social distancing. Go to one of those factories that have figured it out. Reach out to them. Hey, can I showcase, when I'll mention your name, can I showcase how you guys put up, uh, maybe like I see stores doing it, like whatever they have those dividers between or to keep people separate. Anything that you can do to create content around there. And what happens is you suddenly become, hey, that Sarah person's an expert on consulting on how to do this and how this other company opened it. So if you reach out to these companies that open their factories, do some video content showing what they did, speaking with people. And by the way, it's easy to get interviews. You know what people love talking about? Whatever they do, <laughs> it turns out they're really interested and it's way easier than you think to get a guest and start just doing videos around those topics. And you can pick this. I've seen plumbers have excellent YouTube channels just by talking about what they do on pipes. It turns out if you think back to um, the 
famous Mike Rowe with Dirty Jobs, it turns out people are really interested in what other people do. So it's, it's not that hard of a concept to think that what you do, even though it may be slightly mundane if you do it every day, but might be really interesting to other people and create engaging content. So um, that's my story of how I got here and some ideas for YouTube. And I know I went a little bit over 20 minutes. <laughs> Is there questions? I think everyone's on mute. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Um, so um, we have a couple that we can get started. And if anybody else wants to punch their questions in, we can um, go, go that route. How about that? Okay. So Cheryl says, what types of forums, what type of forum and where is it at? You spoke of forums. Ah, so I, I'm specifically using a program uh, software called Discourse. And Discourse allows me to have the forum top to bottom. Now for a lot of people, I'm gonna tell you Facebook forums are really good. The downside of Facebook forums is you don't own the content. You're always tied to the Facebook platform, but the Facebook forums are free. The discourse forums cost money. So you have to decide leverage the free Facebook, which is a good, and a lot of people are on Facebook and it's not a bad thing at all to leverage that. Or do you wanna own the platform? And that's what I chose to do with discourse, but they're both, they're both good options. It's just kind of a decision uh, for me being more techie. I didn't mind the expense it costs to have the uh, discourse software to do it. So um, I've got videos on it and anything um, specific. One of the things I have a lot of is a behind the scenes videos of how I do things. So anyone who wants to reach out and email me, I can send them links to very specific things that I do. And I have usually a, a library of that. Okay. So Roger has a great one. He says, what do you use for screen capture? OBS Studio. That's uh, one of my favorite tools. It's free. Uh, it's actually used by like almost every major big game person on YouTube. OBS Studio is the go-to uh, tool to use. It's really, really good. Um, it's actually supported like the development. The reason it's free is the development of it is supported by a couple of hardware companies that sell really neat hardware like the stream deck and i think i might have a video on it but if you type in like obs stream deck you'll find a lot of interesting videos on exactly how to use it uh, it's a really slick way to uh, switch different views have multiple camera angles it, it's more than just screen capture at the base level it does screen capture but it allows you to extend it into a lot more including makes it really nice for doing live uh content just keep that regular pot um so Mike, maybe you can mute. Yeah, Tom, can you mute everyone, and then okay. Right. Um, the best and easiest way to post video podcasts to all distributors, such as iTunes. So one of the tools out there is Blurberry. Um, I think Blueberry or I can find. I mean, actually, I'll drop the link in there. Uh, B L U R B. Uh, podcast because I always I always yeah, say it wrong blur, and it's, it's what blurberry. it's actually blurberry there we go to me it's just a hard word to remember I dropped the link in the everyone it's uh b l u b r r y dot com they are one of the easier systems out there so you uh, as a podcaster the, this is where YouTube has a big advantage over podcasts so where do you get your podcast from well iTunes or all these other platforms Blurberry is one of the concentrators that will put it and push it to all the other platforms this is where YouTube has such a big advantage of being a singular platform for discoverability so when you put something out on YouTube the discoverability is quite big across all of the you know because of the discoverability engine someone likes your content or a similar tutorial content your content comes up recommended. Harder to do that with uh, podcasts. Okay. From Hassan, he says, lots of success stories in the examples. How many people are making more than, I don't know, was that less than a cent a month? This all seems great, but this can't be easy, right? No, no, it's not easy. I have nothing to sell you. I don't think this is something that everyone should just run out and do. This is not, I'm not uh, rah rahing the entire thing. I'm mean, explaining how I did it. I explained how a few other people did it. If you say, I have no use for this at all, then you might be right. <laughs> I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna oversell it. I have no offer to get you on this and coaching and training. I have nothing to sell. I'm just sharing how I did things. And it works for a lot of people, but you're probably right. There's a lot of people it doesn't work for. Um, you even can look at big companies, and we'll use another tech example because that's my space, but Bill Gates. 
Bill Gates was never the best public speaker, stand out in front of everyone. That's why he even hired other people to work in marketing. So if YouTube was available in the early days of tech and when Bill Gates got started, he still probably wouldn't have made YouTube videos. He would have eventually had the money to hire someone else to make them. Um, but it's not necessarily, if you have no strategy around it, don't go out and buy a bunch of equipment. If you don't have um, some use case for this, don't run out and just think it's the next big thing. It's a big thing if you can use one of those ideas. If you have an idea you think has legs, you have something that you think is valuable, you content you can create around it, it works very well. Now something interesting is um, the number of companies, we've landed several companies that are in the Fortune 1000 that have, given a small contract work. It's amazing how many people with C-level under title watch YouTube. Uh, Dan Gilbert said in an interview, they said, what do you do with your spare time? Like, what do you watch? And he says, oh, I love science videos on YouTube. He said that in an interview and I thought that was so funny. Like, Dan Gilbert, like, he's what does he do at night? He's not watching TV, he's got YouTube on and he's watching science videos. I just thought that was great. I'm like, so trust me, everyone, even not just kids, not just, um, you know, certain niches of people or tech YouTubers, it's a lot of people like Dan Gilbert still on YouTube. He may find and discover something uh, that may be interesting that content you're created. Okay, so earlier you mentioned, you know, people ask about getting more subscribers or, or, or followers. So I'm gonna like rephrase that maybe. So if someone is creating content and they're putting it all out there um, and they don't seem to be getting any traction, what advice would you give them to tweak things or um, or to kind of think about it in a different way to to find their audience? So the first thing is the YouTube algorithm works very, very hard against you when you first start out. Um, we ran into this because I split my content into two different channels for um, some hacking videos I do with some friends because hacking videos are one of those ones that the YouTube likes to uh, ban your entire channel for doing. So we split that in our channel. What you realize very quickly is even with pushing my audience going, hey, we have another channel where we create other content, until we got the first thousand subscribers, you couldn't get more than 10 views on videos. That same video with the same title posted on my main channel had like 20,000 views. So it is really, really hard getting started, guesting on other, once you have some content created, um, reaching out, guesting on other places, you can promote it, you can't even pay and buy views uh, on, on some of the videos. So there are little methods, it's really, really hard to get started, I'm not gonna lie, uh, you talk to dead air for a long time. It's, it, YouTube is more of a long game, not a short term game. Now occasionally, and there's been, uh, Peter McKinnon is really interesting. He does advertising and photography. He's someone who broke all the rules of YouTube and actually um, came out successful. But, but and I like to, before I sell him as a success story, Peter McKinnon worked in advertising and photography. So when he created content, it blew you away with its high end production value. And he already did advertising. So he already knew kind of the how to do things. So he started a YouTube channel and it took him only, I don't know, less than two years to reach his million subscribers. I think it was like a year and a half, he hit a million. So it's really, uh, it takes time. So hopefully that's, it, it's not easy to start. That's, a, uh, that's one thing you have to, you have to be in it for the long game. That's probably my shorter answer. Um, to getting that started. There's no, there's no real easy tricks on it. Create really valuable search for content. By the way, if you would have been an accountant and started with those PPP loan videos, because there's only like two people doing it, this guy with a few million views, you would have killed it. Right place, right time, people searching for that. Uh, so sometimes that can be a real help. If you know people are really searching for something and you have the expertise in it, and I'll you know reach back out to like Sarah said, if you are help could have a solution to HR for how to reopen your business safely, I'm willing to bet people are typing in how to reopen my business safely all day right now in front of the computer. If you have a solution for that, that seems like a niche that I don't know the answer to, but boy, someone could probably create a video on it that knows more than me and I would watch it. <laughs> right. I think that was a great information to say it took the first thousand to get more than a 10 views on a video like that's yeah. good information all right so we have a few more great questions here it says you mentioned one person posting on youtube for 11 minutes typically is there a sweet spot for the amount of time they should run i know this is a loaded question yeah and this is something that um me i was, I was on uh, the detroit startup week i was on a panel and uh i've 
it was funny because I, I was arguing with the other people on the panel, but one other person did agree with me, and we kind of joked that both of us have the most audience. Uh, so Dave, from Pod, who runs Podcast Detroit, and me were both like, content needs to be as long as it needs to be and no longer. And the reason we both said that almost at the same time, while other people said, oh, no, the sweet spot is this many minutes, and someone else was arguing this. Um, what I found is it's – if you're, if you're just in the video umming away to try to make it longer, you've now run out of content. Stop talking. Um, it needs, my tutorials are over when the tutorial is done. So if I'm doing a very complex thing, it's going to be a long tutorial. If it's a very much more simple, like when I broke down that thing for Zoom, that's only nine minute video to break down some of the security behind Zoom because that's all I had to talk about. So a lot of it is how long the content needs to be is as long as you're not just filling dead air and you're keep providing value, that's how long the content should be. Once you're just filling dead air to try to come up with eight more minutes because you think it needs to be 30 minutes every time, then it gets to be tough. Uh, so I, as long as it needs to be is really the answer. And um, what we've actually, um, we're doing some A-B testing with my friend who's doing programming videos. It turns out that doing a deep tutorial called part one, part two, part three, et cetera. He has an eight part video on doing tutorials. That seems like a good idea, doesn't it? Turns out it's a terrible idea. If you take all these videos, even if they're all like an hour long and make one six or eight hour video, it turns out that gets millions of views. Uh, it, people seem to like that better. That was just kind of a surprise because you can index things in YouTube and you can always come back to it. So if they get like an hour into it today, they watch another hour tomorrow. Um, sometimes having a singular long video that's that in depth works out much better than you'd expect. At least it does for programming tutorials. This may vary with other content. Hmm, that's great. It says, um, any advice on how to use cell phone for AV input to Zoom for those who lack a webcam and can't get one since they're out of stock? There are a couple tools for it. Um, there, if, you, if you look, someone has an article, there's a plugin you can load, an app you can load that will turn your cell phone into a webcam. And if you type in how to make a cell phone a webcam, you'll find it. Um, I don't remember the name of the app right now. Of course, you could always just run Zoom on your phone. That's a complete another option as well. Um, but yeah, yeah, webcams, um, they're at really, really short supply right now. Uh, man, if, if I would have known, I would have bought boxes of them as I could be selling webcams. I didn't have the foresight for that. <laughs> How long did it take you to make the revenue that you're making now? So revenue, um, it's taken, it's cumulative over time. I think we hit, we sort of break in, and it's funny because right now it's at, it's coming back up. Um, I think it was about two years in before we started making maybe a thousand to two thousand dollars a month and then it started getting really big uh, last year because it's the revenue is almost seasonal you make way more money because the it, your money is directly a relation to the ad buy and ad spend of advertisers on facebook or I'm sorry on youtube so the more advertisers on youtube the more the ad spend that they're willing to buy and it's a competitive marketplace so the more advertisers the cost is higher for them to advertise. We win, we benefit from that. So if two advertisers go, no, I both want my content on one of these particular videos of this topic, they will ratchet it up. So around October and November and into December, your ad revenue rate spikes and you'll make way, I make more money. I made, I think six or seven, 6,000 or so on uh, December because the ad revenue rate was so much higher because Christmas ads. Um, so they kind of come and go in cycles. The lower months are right now. So it did take a couple of years before I started making revenue, but most of our, uh, I mean, I'm enjoying the money I make off of uh, YouTube. It's, it's definitely a lot of fun, but we also have a lot of other ways we make revenue and so do a lot of other creators. We have our Amazon affiliate links. Um, so we get a percentage of all the sales on Amazon for just referring people. We're not doing anything other than saying, hey, here's a product and here's my affiliate link. Uh, that probably brings in, it varies, but about another three or $4,000 a month. I have a video where I break some of those revenue numbers down. Um, the weirdest thing is, if you told me a couple of years ago, I can make money telling t-shirts, I'm like, but I make tech videos. Turns out we make shirts that my staff wear and people want to buy them. So we started selling shirts that brings in another five or $600 a month in shirt sales. Uh, kind of varies. Sometimes there's like a big sale. There's all these little um, things you can do for revenue, ad placements and things like that. It takes time to build all that though. Okay. Can, um, so can you decide how often ads are shown on your video and can you decide how many ads are shown? You can suggest to YouTube. YouTube has some restrictions on it. So um, 
I can add extra inserted videos. You also have to try and figure out your balance of audience. Now you can force, and in, in some of the back end settings of there, uh, unskippable ads. And some of the really popular YouTube uh, will do, because the highest paying ads are unskippable because they can't just click next. They can't skip it. They can't, they have to watch the whole video. I never turn it on. Some people do. Um, it seems like that would be annoying um, to do. But if you have, if you have exclusive content that's so good and so compelling that no one else, no, they're not going to go somewhere else to watch it and you have it in your head that way, you can do that. I just, I, I figured there's a balance because I want people to watch the content. I don't want to kill them with ads. Um, but yeah, and sometimes you can also take in, uh, once you get qualified for some of the advertising revenue, you can split the video up and add what they call mid-roll ads on top of there. And all these will increase your revenue on there. But at the same time, some people go so over the top with it that people go, I can't watch that person's channel because they took an hour video and inserted 15 ads and it went the max that YouTube would let them and you can drive your audience crazy. So it's finding a happy balance on there. All right. How much of the video, like what portion of the video needs to be watched to get revenue from that video from YouTube? Um, that's a mystery question. I don't know. I think they, they kick off an impression payout after I think it's 15 or 20 seconds. That number varies a little bit and YouTube is, vague at best of how some of those backend things work. They have this whole creator channel that you can watch where they try to explain how the el how they want you to use YouTube, I should say, not how the algorithm works. Um, that's still a secret. But um, they'll tell you some of those breakdowns, but then we'll find out that that number changed on us. So that's always kind of a moving target. But they at least, you're not going to get any ad revenue unless they watch at least, I think it's 15 or 20 seconds is still the number for that. If not, they're just not going to do it. Um, it is asked, could you show the interface you use on YouTube with a share screen? Oh yeah, absolutely. So let me, uh, switch to that. Let's see, we'll go to, I'll show my real time, everything that's in here. Let me go share screen. Let's make sure I get the right desktop again. Hey, there we go. So this is how I see everything in real time. So uh, latest performance video, here's my news roundup. This is the news creator roundup. This is where allegedly they're gonna tell us the new things we're gonna be doing on Google. Um, it's kind of interesting They actually, this was actually good. This, this is not just for me, this is anyone who wants to learn about the backend of YouTube. The CEO and Hank, Hank Green's a really amazing creator and Susan, uh, who is the CEO of YouTube, uh, they did a great video together breaking down what it's like being the CEO of YouTube and um, some of the challenges they face and it, they have some very real challenge. Uh, this is how the analytics dashboard looks like. It defaults to 28 days. So you can see in the last 28 days, I've done $3,500 worth of revenue on here. Uh, gained this many subscribers, watch time. Then we have all the comments. Oh, the comments. Good, nothing profane is in here. Um, occasionally you do have to deal with, uh, the spam system catches a lot of them, but yeah, uh, the spammers and everything else are, are weird. Occasionally you get a bunch of them uh, posting profane things in here. It's not too often, but I do take the time to moderate it. Uh, this is where I'll well, open a new window uh, where you build playlists and things like that. This is where you can actually go edit all the videos. Um, I can dive into any particular video and look at the analytics on it if I want to, to understand better, like the demographics, the audience, actually let's do analytics on this particular video. Here's how it rose. It's still rising right now in terms of views. This particular video I made $34 on. Reach, engagement, audience. Uh, this one's interesting because uh, half the people that watch it seem to be subscribers, which is different. So if we go to my overall analytics, um, we'll go back over here. Analytics, audience, and you can dive into uh, any section you want. This is the like a heat map of when people watch my videos. 36% of my audience is the United States. This is the currently not subscribed is 64%. So that's actually higher. It was a little bit lower not that long ago, but you can dive in there. Uh, my age demographics, so 25 to 34 and 35 to 44. So 60% of my audience fits in the 25 to 44 category, um, 45 to 54. and this is where uh, we just landed a deal with a very large imaging company that does medical imaging. We sold them all the hardware for the back end of their server. And just because I you know, look, know the person on LinkedIn, they fall into this category with a C in their title and spent quite a bit of money with us. Um, found my YouTube videos, 
watching me talk about storage servers, this big, huge company, I won't name their name, but they're big, uh, that does medical imaging equipment, hired us to design the storage servers off of a video they watched for me doing a storage servers. And it's just kind of an interesting. All I'm really doing is talking about my job and people are watching it. And they're, like I said, C-level people in decision-making positions that you may not expect. And this, like I said, this extends beyond the tech industry. There's people um, that watch these videos that are not in that. So was there anything specific they wanted to see in here or just wanted to see what it looked like? Um, I think just um, wanted to see what it looked like. Um, so, okay, I have, an, I have another question for you after I mentioned that Benji said, wow, women do not like your videos. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> that is, uh, I, the tech industry as a whole, it's no secret that uh, you can walk into any computer science or engineering class and you maybe, maybe will have a single female in there. Uh, that is a stat that is unfortunate in the tech industry. So um, it just is reflected on YouTube, the fact that people um, on here, but I will say something I learned interesting, especially working in the hacking uh, and cybersecurity, a huge number of uh, women identify online with male names. And the reason why I was at a keynote at a big, at a conference and uh, this, uh, she's a, an amazing developer. And she for years went with a male name because when someone found out that she was actually a female developer and most things are done somewhat anonymously online, they're looking at your handle, so to speak, not actually your name. When they found out that she was female, they found that they didn't want to submit her uh, code update requests and things like that. So she always chose for a long time just to be a male online. That way everyone just, no one would assume or try to hit on you and keep it that way. So sometimes the statistic may be a little bit skewed on that, but I, overall I do know, as anyone knows, the tech industry is um, overly male dominated right now, which also female YouTubers who talk about tech skyrocket just because, I'm not saying they're not good, but it is easier because um, well, people listen to a female voice. That's that's not a secret either. There's a reason all of our uh, things that talk to us are more often a female voice. Turns out people will listen to them, males, males and females alike. <laughs> Interesting. I, I will admit you're the only tech person I would probably watch on YouTube ever. So <laughs> just because I know you. Okay, for the foreseeable future, YouTube looks like a good avenue for creators. What would YouTube have to do to screw that up? For example, in 2018, they changed the requirements to become a partner. Do you see them making it harder for people to earn revenue directly from YouTube in the future? Yes. Um, they keep raising the bar a little bit, but there's, there's a dark, dark reason for that. So well, there's, there's one that's not so dark. One, people, uh, when monetization was easy, literally I had to keep sending takedown notices because people would take any video that was popular by me or any other YouTuber, grab that video, re-upload it. They wouldn't do any editing. We're talking no effort here. Download here, upload here, create content, start monetizing videos made by other people. So YouTube said, all right, we got to raise the challenge it is to start up a YouTube channel. Uh, and people were really upset by this. It was a challenge, but the other side was kind of obvious. YouTube was like, we're, we're in the middle of it because with 500 hours a minute, we don't have time to audit to say, did someone re-upload Tom's video or is this really Tom's video? And then someone actually has to go look at the two videos, confirm they're the same and take them down. Obviously that from a business standpoint, that doesn't scale very well when you have a thousand people, but 500 hours a minute getting uploaded. The second problem YouTube has is uh, it was used for literally terrorist groups. There's no other way to describe it. Um, really bad, awful people would upload terrible things to YouTube and try to monetize it. They were horrible videos and things like that. So YouTube's had to do a lot of crunching down to vet people better. And, and as literal as it sounds, ISIS was uploading beheading videos and sharing them on YouTube. So it has been, YouTube's had some real dark challenges to deal with creepy people and awful human beings. Um, they are such a tiny piece of our society, but of course you can't have that on YouTube. So they've raised the bar to make it harder for good reasons. But of course, people that get caught up in the algorithm that get angry of how much harder it is to start a channel, you are a side effect of it. And I'm sorry, but it is... So to speak, YouTube sees it for the greater good. And that's actually why that interview with Susan's interesting because, you know, you think about this from a company standpoint, uh, one of my favorite books I read um, is called Without Their Permission, which is by Alexis Ohanian. And it's a really good book about starting an online forum, which is Reddit, became one of the most popular forums on the internet. And he talks about the amazing, you know, feeling of being a startup entrepreneur who has a 
success story, but then also all the awful things he had to deal with and go, wow, I didn't expect to be a startup dealing with people who decided that my platform could be used for child porn. He goes, I didn't see this in my pitch deck. Like, where's the part where I deal with this? And he really breaks down the emotional challenges of it. And this is where YouTube is. You have the largest platform with 2 billion human beings on it. And they're uploading content that you're trying to create an automated system around. So there's going to be times where it gets more challenging just so they can filter the content. And it's, it's going to get harder over time. There's going to be these times where the algorithm goes there. And most recently, we've seen all the craziness where people say, I'm an expert. I'm going to share this really terrible information uh, related to the pandemic and put it on YouTube. And then when they take it down, oh, no, YouTube is uh, censoring free speech. And YouTube is like, no, this is like really bad things that people are telling you. So um, you're going to see more of these challenges coming from YouTube. And it's, it's, it's the reactive result of trying to police 2 billion people with the ability to upload. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, how does YouTube use AI to find copyright violations for music and video uploaded? Oh, this is fun. So uh, there's a few people, and uh, me and one of my cybersecurity friends, we got to see some behind the scenes on this. So one, they're indexing every word we use, and the YouTube, uh, YouTube and Google as a whole. You ever talk to your phone and realize how well it understands things? Let's take it a step further. The way the YouTube voice recognition system works is it's contextual. If I asked um, how old is Clint Eastwood, I can ask that question to Google, right? Then I can ask the next follow-up question of how tall is he? Now, that's actually a big leap in AI because now I've started with one question, pivoted to another, which any one of us would answer in a heartbeat with, oh, yeah, he's this tall. Uh, but YouTube has to contextually understand the question you're ans asking related to the secondary one. They've done an amazing job doing the AI. They take that AI and point it at the YouTube videos. It indexes every word you use, then derives context for the words. Now, why is all that important? Well, what happens is if you were to create a video that says one thing, but you say another, you will find that video get ranked down because the content doesn't match the title. The same thing goes for copyright violations. Uh, music is actually really, really easy to index as, as well as any of us can recognize from a partial graphic what something looks like. I show you something partially. You're like, oh, that's uh, this or that's that. Um, the YouTube algorithm works very same way for music. And anytime it senses a few notes, occasionally it gets it wrong, a few notes or a piece of content that it knows has been uploaded to the copyright machine, it's using that same indexing to go, that is a video you pulled off of ABC News and then re-uploaded to YouTube. That's a video you pulled off of The Tonight Show and re-uploaded. And But this is where fair use gets to be a real problem because we have the right to fair use, but the algorithm has a hard time understanding that and frequently sends a copyright claim, and then everyone gets angry again. <laughs> okay. What matters most? How long someone watches, views, comments, subscribers, or a combination? Uh, it's a combination of them. Um, subscribers matter very little. So subscribers are cool for a bragging thing. And I got a little plaque that says I got over 100,000 subscribers. Um, but the reality is what really matters is, well, what, what first start with your goal? What, if my goal is, do I make money on YouTube? Absolutely. There's one goal. Second goal, do we want bookings of clients? Absolutely. Does it work for that? Yeah. So it doesn't matter to me if they commented, if my goal is bookings and watching my video got it there. Uh, so the exact minutes, number of minutes they view, as long as they viewed it enough to engage with it, it seems to be effective. Um, the comments do help show that there is some, uh, you know, reason people like the video. They'll watch the comments, so they're, that can help rank it up higher. The same with the like button on YouTube actually means quite a bit. At this moment right now in 2020, this could be completely changed. They could have removed the like button tomorrow. It might happen. YouTube's changed the algorithm a couple times. They used to have the subscribe button with the bell, um, and I would have told you that subscribe button in 2018 was important. And then YouTube changed the algorithm and admitted in one of their talks that, yeah, we quit using that as an indicator. <laughs> they literally just, after telling everyone to use it from a creator standpoint, they just dropped it one day and decided, yeah, we don't, that's just, that bell button doesn't do anything. It just makes it uh, maybe, so maybe we'll suggest your video to someone. So anything I say now is only relevant is to that. And it is some combination there of, of the algorithm, which we're not privy to exactly. YouTube does not offer a blueprint on how it works. That's how they keep people from gaming the system as well. Okay. So we'll, we'll go to two last questions. Sure. Uh, he says, I have under 1000 subscribers, but there are ads in my videos. 
when I hit the 1000 subscriber number, will that backlog pay out or is YouTube just keeping that ad revenue? YouTube's just keeping that ad revenue. Um, you can, so any videos you had before you were monetized, um, you can go back and monetize them, but videos you posted, uh, you don't get any backlog of ad revenue. Matter of fact, this was one of the, um, some of the large tech YouTubers who derive their living, so to speak, off of ad revenue. I'll give an example. Uh, there's, there's a couple of tech YouTubers who get like the new iPhone when they're released. So they're first, they get to review it, but they're under embargo and they have a release date. They're going to release it on the day that YouTube uh, stops the embargo. This is common in a lot of uh, reviews. So you get to test the product, you get to review it. You make all your money because you really only care about the new features and the review of the new iPhone when it comes out. Two years from now, you don't care. You're like, that's the two-year-old iPhone. Why would I even watch that video? Um, what's happened to some people is unfortunately, and this is also where they don't give you a backlog, if they decide your content is not worthy of for whatever reason, and they demonetize that particular video, and then they monetize it later. And one of the tech YouTubers is pretty upset. He got like 10 million views on his new iPhone video. The first 8 million he got no revenue for because they decided there's something in there that made it demonetized. They don't know what, and later he got it monetized, but he got none of the back revenue for it either. So even after you're monetized, you can still lose because it's based on views, you can still lose and they don't give it back to you. So it's unfortunate. It can be um, highly aggravating, especially because that's not an evergreen piece of content. That, that content's only relevant when the new iPhone came out and he got the views. He didn't get any of the ad revenue for it. So those are, those are definite risks you have. Okay. Was your last one. Do you do much live YouTube and do you need many admins? Um, live YouTube is fun. I do it every Thursday. Um, I'm consistent on that with, uh, I think the last few years I've not missed a single Thursday for doing all of my live shows. Um, right now I'm up to about 300 people. Uh, I think we're at 325 was the peak at, at, at last Thursday's uh, live show. Um, the comments do roll by really fast, but I'm not going to say that I need too many people to admin it. Um, it's, it's actually for 300 people, they don't all comment. So it's actually not too bad in terms of uh, that. I mean, overall, I, you know, I, I said I do admin the comments even on YouTube, but I delete a comment a day. And when you talk about 1.3 million people, 1.3 million unique viewers over 90 days and only deleting one comment a day, it's actually not too bad. I'm going to say, and the same thing with the live streams. Um, I rarely ban more than one or two persons. And it's usually a spammer. Uh, like a spam bot will find your sh live stream because they look for live streams and they just start posting the same link over and over again until you ban them. So they're not too bad. It's usually not a person doing it. It's usually some automation tool that you just want to get rid of. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you, Tom. And I'll turn it over to Matt now. Okay. Matt, you're on mute. Yep, you're on mute, Matt. I don't think he. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I guess I uh, guess we got to wrap things up here. Thank you, going so much for all the questions. Um, really do appreciate you guys taking your time out of your day to be here. And Tom, thank you so much for for your expertise and for sharing your knowledge. Um, Again, if you haven't given us an intro and an ask in the chat, feel free to do that. We're going to be making sure that we get all of this info uh, out to everybody through our Facebook page and through our email subscription, like our newsletter. So if you uh, haven't joined either of those, feel free to find us. And um, in the meantime, I hope everybody is staying safe. Big thank you from LA2M to you guys. Big thank you to you, Tom, again. Um, yeah, I hope you have a great rest of the day, great rest of the week, and we hope to get something like this going for you guys again next month. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you.